This is Clean Radio. Welcome everybody out there listening to Clean Radio on our flagship station, 790 KABC or on the World Wide Web at cleanradio.com or in the middle of the Sirius dial, XM channel 243. Um, and it's not I the say, end. It's not the last channel of the dial. Yeah. And in studio with me tonight is my co-host with the most, Andrew. He's so smart, hey. Google uses him Welcome. as a search engine, Spanswick. That's right. Um, Great. Do that. And uh, I, I gave it a shot. I don't think it's going to work. But I, I think, But I'm going to keep changing them. You are? Okay. Yeah. So All every right. week it's... You uh, have to start a new webpage each week, man. Um, it's not a bad idea. Well, uh, Andrew Spanswick, uh, co co Owner of a clean treatment center, been in the industry for countless years, yeah, a long time treating people, yeah. and uh, it's important for the people out there that are listening to know that because a lot of people out there are struggling with addiction, absolutely, and mental health, problems. and mental health, so. and that's you know the two of them really do go hand in hand, right? Especially going for cats. <laughs> <laughs> um, but talk about that a little bit because a lot for a long time people didn't put them two together. Oh, alcoholism and, 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 uh, and mental, mental illness. You know, if you had a mental illness, illness, you were put in that type of facility. If you had alcoholism, you were put in a other type of facility. Yeah, for a long time, uh, substance abuse hasn't, it was considered part of, uh, to cause other mental illnesses or people had mental illnesses, and therefore they had a symptom of uh, having a problem with addiction or um, alcoholism. Um, it isn't until recently that people have really started to integrate treatment of both, and we call that dual diagnosis treatment. So. And also, more importantly, last week we were talking about on the show. You were, you know, you were just recently in uh, England, London, and you were talking about how they're constantly, you know, every time a drug gets banned, they switch it up a well, little. Well, they have bit. all these drugs, yeah, that you can get online called uh, legal drugs. Is right. the big term in Britain and uh, in Europe, and they have websites all over the place. And uh, there's these chemists that are just coming up with new hallucinogens constantly. And there's over 700 legal hallucinogens you can find in this one website online. And uh, they basically, every time the government makes it illegal, it takes months and months to make one uh, substance illegal. They make it illegal and they just, all, they have like three or four ready to replace it right away. They just pop in the next one. So uh, it's becoming a point where even regulation with legalization or criminalization, even if we had legalization with regula regulation, it would still be almost impossible to regulate some of the stuff that's happening. And it brings us to, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about on tonight's show. We have an amazing show for the people out there that are listening. If you just tuned in, you are listening to Clean Radio. We have uh, one of the a guy I've known for many, many, many years. He's uh, had a top, a couple top 10 hits and uh, in both country and pop and uh, pop and country and somewhere in the <laughs> in middle. Order, yeah. And uh, we have an amazing, uh, a, a, an amazing uh, clinical person. And, and you know, in the beginning of the show is saying, we have professional guests and celebrity guests tonight. We actually have two. And he's got an amazing facility in uh, Malibu. His name is uh, Jeff Nealon. And uh, please say I pronounced that correctly. No, Jeff Nalen. Nalen, I'm sorry. Um, I was practice how many times shot. before the show? I, I practiced quite a few times. And uh, Jeff Nalen. And uh, um, and we have a great he, he show. nailed it that time. That's, we're here to help you. It's and so we have okay. a great we're show. Here to, we're here That's right. We can't you remember your name, but we're, we're but, very good at uh, you. First off, we have Jaron Lowenstein, a guy, like I said, I've known for a long time. And uh, you might remember him. Me a lot and, of cred uh, on this show. and that's why I gotta say, you know, uh, it, it was a really cool story, Andrew, about this is that actually we went to the same school in Israel, right. and uh, he was a year ahead of me, so he's a little bit older than I am, and uh, it's got a really amazing story. We went to the school in Israel for like Jews Gone Wild, okay, and I um, kid you not, <laughs> you know, it was it was a school where parents like didn't know what to do with their kids sometimes, right. so they sent them to this school. It was on the outskirts of Israel. I guess you're not gonna name it. Yeah, uh, it was. I, I, it's called Neve, and Neve, uh, okay. it's a very famous school in our community. It uh, there was another famous band that came out of there, a band called Disturbed. Oh really? Uh, with De David yeah, yeah. Draymond. It would be a little bit more apropos. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, no. and, and <laughs> pop, right. The, a squeaky clean pop. The squeaky, duo. The, you're right, but uh, yeah, David Draymond sort of symbolizes what Neve was <laughs> exactly. in the band Disturbed. <laughs> he was more on the pop charts, but uh, I mean, huge pop charts, and. Uh, and it's really a cool story because in clean right now, what's amazing is that we actually have kids, you know, kids, 20 to 24 year olds that went to the same school as us in Israel. And um, they were really stoked. A couple of them, I told them when you were going to be in the studio tonight, because we all know each other. And they were just like, it gave them hope. 
And, uh, you know, when you're in rehab and, and sometimes you could lose hope, Andrew, and it was like really cool that one of our guys, you know, that was in that school made it through and is in clean, on clean radio tonight. So yeah. made it through on the pop charts. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, I'm a normie. By, by the way, okay. you're not getting royalties on that yeah. clip there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to let you know. <laughs> and also let's welcome uh, Jeff Nealon. 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 And uh, who owns right. Paradigm <laughs> uh, Treatment Center in Malibu for Adolescents. Yeah. And you got to come a little closer to the mic. Sure. Um, and there are a lot of parents out there that are listening to. There are a lot of family members out there that are listening tonight that have teens in trouble, that have kids in trouble. You know, just like that school we were in in Israel. There was we were 16, 17, 18 year old, and and we didn't know where to go. In those days, that's where they sent us for our drug problems. Right. 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 Was to that school. The desert. So yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, there's a there's a tremendous amount of youth out there that are uh, that are that are dealing with these substances at an earlier and earlier age. So, uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we're we're you know busy right now. And one of the things I love about your place and um, is that you also treat family members because a lot of times and I want to talk about that a little bit because it's an important topic to talk about is that in your facility you often have adolescents that come but find that the family members are also troubled. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, the families are a huge key component to it, that uh, if somebody's going to get better in the family, it's going to change the whole dynamic, and the family has to get on board with it. And a lot of times we have youth that have beginnings of serious issues, but the families are, and the dynamic of the families are really contributing to some of the disturbances, whether it's mental health or chemical dependency, because they go together, as you said. Yeah, I see that a lot with adolescents where, yeah. the, you know, the family dynamic is setting the kid up for the symptoms of substance exactly. abuse, but then you get in there and the parents are have severe problems, or there's longitudinal problems where it's not just the parents, it's the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, and all together they create one one big mess, mess. To sort out yeah a variety yeah. pack of a mess and we do we yeah. get kids at, at every sort of stage of use we'll get kids who are really just beginning but the family issues they've become the identified patient because that's where it gets dumped on right and then we have other people who are you know really full on into their use already and the parents are trying to deal with it I think so. a lot of people don't realize though that adolescents that have early substance abuse problems tend to be very sensitive so and they tend to be the most sensitive in the family. That's and, exactly right. And so they're the ones that are showing the symptoms of the, this family dysfunction. The other ones are hardened by years of dysfunction. But you know, you get these young kids in, and all of a sudden they're they're like, "This shouldn't be this way. There's something wrong." There's no yeah. doubt. They feel things really strongly, and their use usually starts off by just trying to numb that a little bit and get a little bit of a thicker skin, and then it takes off from there. But. Right. Uh, they are definitely the sensitive ones of the family. Sounds like every Jewish family to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, and if, that's just because you went to that school. Yeah, that's right. But, but here's the question I have. We used for to call you. it Spielkes. Now they call it anxiety. Apparently, I don't know. <laughs> but here, here, here's the thing. Uh, he's no longer I'm singing working anymore. On him. We're working he's on now him. performing at like Shecky's House of Pancakes. <laughs> <That's> it, <right. laughs> well, now that he's doing country music and yeah. added as a Jew, I don't yeah. think the South is going to like that. That, <laughs> that, that. that is pretty amazing. But you know, let's get back to that for a second because you were a school you know where there was the drug use the drinking was a lot how did you and your brother stay away from that in a school but i was in a rock band right you were before, right you know i i literally there were there wasn't a time that we had a tour bus without cocaine on it i mean it was there was tons of drinking tons of drugs and i don't know i think about it. it's funny because i go into a meeting here and there well as you know i run this this uh, writers and artists program for paradigm malibu where we work together with uh, dr jeff and bringing uh, artists and writers and people into the speak with the kids and sometimes I go to these meetings and I'm like this is this is exactly me and I become more and more sensitive to it and more compassionate towards it because I feel like even though I'm a normie I didn't fit in in a lot of ways but I just never for whatever reason it was whether it was my parents or something else I I never just I wasn't cool enough I was never sophisticated enough I just never thought like oh drugs were an option for me so I had different outlets or different coping mechanisms that were either given to me on a uh I don't know, like a, a, a genetic level or uh, through nurturing or through some other way or through or, or honestly probably by luck or just the peer group or whatever it was or an amalgamation of all that. But I just never turned to drugs. It was never something that there was just never it was a disconnect. It never just seemed like, oh, you'll do this. And, uh, you know, I was the guy that would drink and, you know, by 11 o'clock at night, I was like, all right, it's time to shut it down for me. It just. Mm. So I don't I don't I don't want to take any credit for not uh, dabbling in it or or getting wrapped up in it because I certainly had a lot of fun and partied, but it never just. Jaren's I mean, got one of the things that I think is really important though. I've known Jaren since he's born because our families knew each other, and 
One of the things that he has, which we like to get going in the treatment center, is he's always been able to be a really authentic person, whether he says he's an idiot or whether he's just being himself whoa, in whatever whoa. way, you know? <laughs> he, it, okay. He's always been pretty authentic. And I think that that, in more, more times than not, has really saved him because – uh, when things got tough, he he was able to express those things. He wasn't somebody who stuffed them down. And I think that, as much as anything else, there is something, something to that about the authentic- authenticity. By the way, if you just tuned in, you are listening to Clean Radio. Give us a call. The number here is eight hundred two 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 five two two two. That's 800-222-5222. Uh, we're in the studio tonight with. Uh, Rock, country, uh, hip hop star, uh, Mo- ja- hip hop mogul. I've always wanted to hip hop <laughs> mogul, Jaron Lowenstein, and uh, Jeff Nalen. Jeff Nalen, uh, Jeff Nalen. Uh, one of the owners and co-founders of Paradigm Malibu Treatment Center for Adolescents. And uh, give us a call. And one of the things Andrew and I constantly, after the shows and throughout the week, we're constantly getting Facebook messages and private messages from people. We know this is one of the toughest things to talk about. It's uh it's hard and we love the messages we're getting via Facebook and uh, and all that jazz but it's so important that we're talking about this tonight with adolescents and you know maybe like you always talk about is you know you don't have to go that far yeah I mean there's you know we always talk about uh, use abuse and addiction and I think that we see that you know early onset we were talking about onset coming earlier and earlier and the level of addiction becoming greater uh, with teens I mean what are you seeing now what's the average age that you're Treating, you think? We're still getting a lot of people in the 15, 16, 17, but right. we're, we're seeing more and more of the younger. You know, we're licensed for 12 to 18 and uh, very rarely get those 12 year olds in treatment, even if there's a lot of 12 year olds that have issues, but their parents aren't sending them away to treatment as much at that age. Right. But we have a lot of 14 year olds. And I was talking with somebody before the show about the prescription drug use is really vamping things up a lot quicker right. for people because you can get a hold of those and you're instantly Let's talk about that because a lot stuff. of people out there that are listening, we often talk about that on this show. It's easier for a teenager, for an adolescent to get a hold of you know, prescription Anything. drugs from the medicine cabinet yeah. than yeah. it is. Not to, just theirs, their neighbors. Their neighbors, neighbors right. Yeah. It's, it's easier to, you know, to pharmaceutical yeah. shop and yeah. steal than it is to get booze or drugs. Or, yeah, and there's lots of people in schools that don't like their meds, and so right. they bring them to schools and they sell them, and it's completely read, readily available. And it's not like the old days where, ooh, marijuana was the gateway drug that gets you going. It's like, no, these guys are going right to the opiates, they're going right to the benzos, and uh, you know, and they can grab them really quickly. So uh, it's it's been starting earlier and earlier. Um, a lot, I think, getting deeper because because of some of those issues. This what is think, the. What do you think of legalization of marijuana in California? You know, I, I've had these arguments with people that I my I don't have the the I don't I don't believe in the legalization of marijuana for one reason and the only reason I I don't I don't have issues with the drug in and of itself except for from an emotional standpoint it completely disconnects you from your emotional from your ability to connect with your emotional material which is what treatment is all about how do I get back in touch with and identify and start communicating what's going on for me otherwise I'm just stuffing it away and and weed is really great at putting it away and you, you hear a lot of young people who are incredibly anxious and they smoke weed and it's gone and I say that temporarily it's gone but it gets kind of tucked away somewhere right. and my analogy is always sort of like it's just like putting a cork in a volcano everything's fine for a while, but the rumbling starts to build around 16, 17, if that's your go-to uh, the thing coping. Is, I mean, it causes huge problems with developmental progress with adolescents. Of course. I mean, there's so. all the research on the brain and everything. When I'm when I'm having the discussion with adolescents, I put all of that aside, that it's like, I, you just aren't connecting to where you are emotionally, and that's the only thing that you have to do right now. But you're right. I mean, the brain development's going on until mid-20s, and you're, 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 you're yeah. playing with that a lot. But I think we've got to move past this question because it's going to be legal, and I think we have to deal with the next part, which is, you know, at what point did parents step in and, and deal with that? Well, because I mean, why alco- shouldn't yeah, adults be you. able to... I mean, alcohol is legal, too, and adolescents right. still get that. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, yeah. When do you, like, why should parents, you know, adults be punished because, you know, huh. a kid can, uh, you know stifle his mental growth and whatnot, <laughs> whatever you doctors call it, screw himself up at a young age. Um, you know, arrest we his adults, developmental yeah, yeah, you should arrest his developmental growth. But why, you know, why should adults be punished because of, you know, again, like alcohol, right. they can get Again, I don't, I don't think the legal thing is the issue because, as you said, you know, uh, alcohol is legal. All the prescription drugs are legal. You right. know, it doesn't, but there's, there's a psychological component that's especially important during adolescence as they're developing who they are, even if you're forgetting all the biological things that are developing in the brain, just the emotional part 
uh, is it, the goal of adolescence is to be is to start identifying who you are as a human being, and if you cloud it with these things where you can't connect to this authentic piece that we're talking about that that somebody like Jaron had early on, if you don't know how to be authentic, you're in a lot more trouble and a lot more susceptible to some of these things. The than, problem than is other though, really, is that in adolescence is a time of experimentation. It's a time where people are trying to figure out their own identity. That's really the the prime time yeah. to hopefully develop a you know some sort of solid sense of identity and testing and using drugs tends to be you know one of those stages but it's uh, getting even, younger and younger That's, well you know i mean there's always been problems let's face it i mean you know uh how many irish uh catholics have we had here that said they were born with a bottle in their mouth yeah, right? right you know yeah. it's like uh Wait, you know, a lot of it, was that a bottle a lot of it's <laughs> cultural i mean a lot of it has to do with our society and we're seeing <laughs> this weird shift now in society where all these new substances are coming in and new combinations of substances. I mean, you know, five, 10 years ago, we weren't talking about, well, I guess we were talking about Ritalin, but we certainly weren't talking about oxycodone, um, you know, being rampant in high schools. And, yeah. uh, and now it is. Now it's, you know, a gateway drug to heroin. And, I, and I agree with you that I think for all generations, that initiation into adulthood goes with experimenting and trying on different kinds of things and different altered perceptions. But when you when you start with oxy, it's a different game, and yeah. uh, even even the psychotropic meds, you know, starting to get introduced really young. Lots of people at six and seven and eight and nine when they have issues, it, there's something going on there, right. uh, you know, that their brain's still developing, and you're developing it with some kind of you know psychotropic med. You know, it's it's uh, the, you know people are playing a lot of roulette, and that's why they don't know exactly what's you know what's going to work for certain people because it, everybody's different, and you just have to take all that into account. And you know, there's harm reduction things you can do with young people early on, and most importantly, I think when treatment is working, it's about people being clear enough and clean enough you know, the to rhetoric, start to the, start accessing The rhetoric that. on most of this is that you know the failure of parents in the traditional family is what has caused problems with teen alcoholism and drug abuse. Um, do you think family structures change that much? Do you think people are accepting the new family structures that exist? Do you think there's any reality testing that's going on by parents and by society in general to say, hey, you know what? Things aren't the way they used to be. There's combined families. There's different types of families. We're not going to have the perfect family. Maybe we never had the perfect family. You know, how do you approach that with adolescence and, and using drugs? Well, I, I mean, there is no perfect family and all families, uh, you know, fight and all families are crazy on some level. It's it's how are we moving towards health and are we able to identify like what's going wrong in our particular family and start to move towards something healthier. And I tell parents all the time, like the tightrope that you're walking is uh, – especially in adolescence, is you've got to give people uh, enough rope to sort of move on their own without hanging themselves. Parenting a five-year-old is not parenting a 10-year-old, is right. not parenting a 15-year-old. And parents have to upgrade their own defenses for those kinds of things. And usually you see problems in the family when people get stuck in some kind of stage and they want it to be the way it was. And well, most parents just evolving. mirror how they were raised. And that's, yep. the, that's the coping skills they have for parenting, right? And as society's changing yep. and these new substances are coming in and- you know, I also think they don't have the understanding. Well, that's my point. Yeah. That's my point is that, you know, now they, a lot of parents don't realize that, you know, kids in high school are taking opiates that are right. in the form of pills that are much, much stronger than anything they ever had right. seen and in the 60s. Right, but that's part of the problem, know? right? Because they did it. Yeah. They think, well, I did it. It's not it's not that bad. And look at me now, not realizing how more far more dangerous the drugs are now. Yeah, and I think I think the pressures are different too. It's like, you know, I mean, I probably sound like an old fart, but it's like being uh, a teenager back when I was a teenager is not the same as being a teenager now. What's, what's and they, different? What's different now? Well, I, I think there's a there's a tremendous amount of pressure to uh, uh, get older quicker and be cooler quicker you know i right. when i was in high school it's ironic because we're living longer I, I really didn't have to add that i just feel like the, i feel like i, I feel like the john oats of it's okay this, it's this you're special getting, guest getting, duo over here you're yeah. getting to be young i gotta get a line in <laughs> your 70s the new 20. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just remember in, in in high school there was you know the ten percent of people who sort of used and they were on the back step somewhere right. by the by Listen the gym to Led Zeppelin or and something. And it's <laughs> flipped completely. Yeah, it's completely flipped. And there's a there's a tremendous amount of pressure on young girls to be uh, well, just access sexual to porn and on to the be internet. physically yeah. attractive. Like, well, it's sexting and, everything. and all of that yeah. internet. I mean, the kids today aren't going to. I, I think Ford came out with a study a few, a few months ago that was, they were talking about how 
they're not selling as many cars anymore to the kids because they're no, there's no mad rush to get out of the house. Yeah, right. When I was a kid, the first day <laughs> yeah. one of my friends turned 16, it was like, get I'm a car. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Ne- well, left. also your parents aren't around, so you have the whole house to yourself. You well, know? now they, right. Yeah. Now I have a house to myself. It's amazing. <laughs> 39 is awesome. 39 is just, just get there. The I actually think that's a great point. And what you're saying is there, there has been this hops, you know, when we were younger, you know, you'd call all your friends on the phone and get everybody would go to the park. Right. You know, you'd, you'd, yeah. you'd get 18 kids at the park. Now it's 18, you know, on a... You'd on, have to go hang out somewhere in right. the woods or something. It's like you're, you're literally <laughs> on a joint text message. That's today's new sports. Yeah. It's yeah. like, okay... No pun intended yeah. there on the joint text yeah, The only message. time it mattered who was the oldest kid in the gray was when you were about 15. You're like, wait a second. Yeah. Judah's going to get his license first. Yeah. I got to be friends with <laughs> that. But that was your ticket out. Now right. kids are just like, whatever. I've been out of the house since I'm eight right. with my cell phone. I've been driving on my uh, Xbox yeah. for right. 22 years. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly right. And I mean, and I think that does have a huge part. That's a huge uh, part. Yeah. Is that we've advanced with technology so much. These kids with this, with the young girls. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, I'll be, I'll, I didn't know what a girl was till I was 16. Yeah. All I cared about was my, was my uh, guy the, friends. The views <laughs> and uh, ideas expressed by Judah do not oh, wow, represent this, the yeah, kids right. that went to that uh, school yeah. in Israel. I Go said ahead. I was, continue. I, I said I was 16. When I got to Israel, I was 17. Just saying. Actually, yeah. Judah thought he was the girl. Those weren't the type of kids that went there. Okay. Whoa. The, the show took a whole different. By the way, if you just tuned in, we are, you are listening to clean radio believe it or not we have calls lining up uh we'll get to them after the break we have a great really a great uh couple guests and tonight we have jeff nalen you see i went to you first and i said your name you correctly did. owner operator co-owner operator of uh paradigm um malibu and it's really an awesome site i gotta tell you you have an amazing website oh thanks and if you offer tons of stuff and i i really wanted to check this place out because it's for adolescents and at clean we're constantly getting calls from parents you know, for, you know, adolescents, and we don't always know where to or send them. Or we work them. with the parents, and then yeah. they find that their kids have the, a problem Their kids are well. having a problem, yeah. and it's really good to know, because I was looking at your place, and I was like, I want to go to this place. <laughs> I mean, you guys have everything you could ask for. Yeah. You have at this place, and... Uh, I have a thing for teenagers it, that didn't sound come out correctly. <laughs> I have a, I have a place cut. in my heart for, uh, t- for uh, teenagers in trouble. Still bad. Oh, and, okay. uh, for teenagers in trouble. And I love your facility. Uh, we're gonna get a, we're gonna get to the phone calls after the break. Give us a call at 800-222-5222. That's 800-222-5222. Uh, give us a call. And the discussion continues at Clean. Are you or someone you care about addicted to drugs or alcohol? Addiction ruins lives and destroys families. Bring an end to the pain and suffering by calling Clean Treatment Centers. Clean has helped people from around the world break free by not only treating the addiction, but the underlying causes and providing vital aftercare so people can get clean and stay clean with no gimmicks and no false promises. If you need immediate assistance or just have questions, call Clean Treatment Centers for guidance. A much better life awaits. This is Clean Radio. Welcome back to Clean Radio. Uh, we have an amazing show going on tonight. We have uh, Jaron Lowenstein, a uh, famous jazz musician uh, <laughs> from and the jazz mogul. duo of <laughs> Evan and Jaron, and uh, Jeff uh, Nalen, uh, clinical director at Paradigm Malibu, and also co- one of the founders. And, uh, of course, my co-host with the most, Andrew Spanswick. We're having a great conversation going on tonight about adolescence and drug abuse and all that jazz. And uh, I think it's very important. Different to, kind of jazz. Different than kind of jazz than you being <laughs> a jazz be musician. Uh, you know what, though? Can I tell you something? I mean, you, first you were pop rock. Yeah. You know, then you went to country. I really I mean, didn't mean to pull the conversation on me, but I'm not going to stop you. But, you know, <laughs> next is the next logical jump. Narcissism is being fed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the next logical jump would be Hip-hop, jazz. I think. Or jazz. Or jazz. Or jazz. Or jazz. Or jazz. I think you have, to have, you have to have real talent to play jazz. I thought it was celebrity <laughs> rehab. I thought that was <laughs> yeah. the yeah. stuff. That's if it gets really bad. <laughs> yeah. You have to have real talent to get in there, too, by the way. <laughs> Let's get to a call. Let's go. We have Alan in uh, California. Welcome to Clean Radio, Alan. Oh, hi. <clears throat> uh, thank you for taking the call. I uh, congratulate everybody for doing what you do. You're not letting the kids down, but let me get right to, to some points. Sure. I think what needs to happen is we need to blow up the uh, television screens and, the, um, you know, um, all of the, the video shows and things that are shown uh, to show kids um, that there's other directions to go. And number one is uh, there's a program a lot of times ago called Secure Straight. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. They they have these kids. They take them to prison. They they, they still have it, by the way. Yeah, well, they have oh, a show on a TV on it now. Yeah. But it, it was a program that started in the 70s. Yeah. And yeah. they redid it. I don't want to say what yeah. network it's on, but they do have that show now again. Yeah. It's Return well, to Scared Straight or something. Yeah, Scared well, Straight they Extreme. Do, they need to do, do something like that for drugs. Uh, for uh, end result to show these people, like this lady that smoked from her neck, and she's talking through her neck and through a tube. Right. These kind of crazy things. I mean, I mean you know, Jackson, Alan, not to interrupt you, but, uh, you know, we do sort of have it. It's called the news. You or know, cops. I mean, yeah, those know, commercials we, stress know, me out so much, I feel yeah. like I have to walk outside and have a cigarette. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really, <laughs> but, but seriously, uh, you know, like the news, I mean, every day we hear about some celebrity that's dying. I mean, you just multiply that by the number of normal people that aren't celebrities. Um, and you can see okay. the effect this is having on our culture and on people. Alan, here's the problem, and I'm okay. going to tell you this right away. It's like when I was growing up as a kid, they had that public service announcement. When I was younger, I wanted to be a <laughs> I wanted to be a rock star, and you know, then you, you see the person like smoking crack. You know, when I was younger, I wanted to be a track star. Then you saw the person shooting heroin, and you know, they were sort of like these gimmicky types of commercials. You had Nancy Reagan's "Just Say No." But I, they didn't scare me. Well, they have the truth campaign now with tobacco, which right. ironically is funded by the tobacco. Yeah, that's uh, lobby. But, lobby but. but it doesn't scare kids. Kids aren't scared. Well, of, even if it does, yeah. I mean, and I appreciate Alan's point no, that right. uh, the, the, all the research shows that you can scare the heck out of anybody, and and it, it's it's short lived. It might alter behaviors in the short term, but it doesn't do the long term stuff. And you know, part of the reason that Paradigm Malibu came about is that adolescent treatment has a long history of being compliance-based, punitive stuff to try to break people down. Right. And that, the research shows that that just also, doesn't you know, last long term. Adolescents have depression. They look at a lot of their role models like, you know, Kurt Cobain or, uh, you know, even Jimi Hendrix or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. people who well, ended up even... overdosing. Wait, hold on a second. People who ended up overdosing and they, that still doesn't stop them from doing drugs. They still want to emulate the people that actually died in their 20s, like, no. you know, 27 and 29. Sure. Well, 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 you know, just like Michael Jackson. I mean, you know, he could have accidentally, uh, some chick could actually get propofol, pop pop whatever it's called. And, uh, and take it and uh, and, and actually die. Uh, just to let them know that anything they put into their body, mm -hmm. they're taking a chance on losing their life. And, and, and this planet belongs to them. If they can realize that this planet, from oceanography to the next scientific discovery, this is their planet for the next hundred years. Double they're rainbow. taking over in the next five, ten years. They're going to be the next scientists. Alan, and, and you know what? Alan, and here's mm -hmm. the thing. That scares them. You telling them, you telling a drug addict or a kid that's going through a rough time that he might die, he might want that, okay? Because a kid that's going through a family that has alcoholic parents or a crazy home, telling him he, he's going to get it's a actually There's a technical term for it. Right? It's called a yeah. parado paradoxical intervention. Right. And mm -hmm. you're, you're not really supposed to use it for people that are potentially suicidal. Right. And well, so, well, what, I, well, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is not that they're going to die, that they're going to miss out on being part of, yeah, of, that doesn't, of building this, this right. world. Alan, think you know, about something like this for a second. Alan, I okay. want you to think about this. Somebody okay. that's willing to shoot something in their arm, smoke, you know, crack, smoke all that stuff, do you think they're caring about missing Disneyland, mi missing Disneyland <laughs> and, the, and the 10 years of the future? They're not. That scares them. And the reason that people are doing it, you know, I can speak to young people, that young people start doing those things because they feel overwhelmed already. And this is something that they think is going to help and it might help in the short term, but it's it's overwhelming. And Andrew made the point at the, at the beginning of the show that there's no... Uh, you didn't say it this way, but there, but with addiction, chemical dependency, I don't think there's any chemically dependent young person that isn't a dual diagnosis right. patient. Right. There's anxiety, there's depression, there's trauma in their past. And so the fear factor, breaking people down, clearly doesn't work. The last thing you want to do is break somebody down that's been through trauma. By the way, Alan, thank you for the call. Um, you're completely right with what you're saying. And we, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was actually in New York on the phone, that was one of the last things we were talking about was, you know, one of Andrew's issues with certain shows on TV is that they, you know, with the detox, you yeah, know, that they come right on say like celebrity yeah. rehab where they show people having seizures yeah. and throwing up. And the fact is they're not properly medicated yeah. during detox. And this you is, shouldn't have to go through that during detox. Right. And this is what I was saying. If you, tr if anybody, this is just me. Ratings, any, ratings. <laughs> anybody that believes in this uh, tough love or beating somebody down thing doesn't understand addiction. Right. 
because right, somebody... they understand punitive measures, and that's why we have a correction, a, a juvenile right. correctional system that you know is full of people that have drug problems. And... Yeah, and it's an easier way of treating people because oh, because you don't understand that I'm going to beat you down. Right, and that's like the old school sort of treatment. It is right. It's it's called jail. <clears throat> That's yeah. not how you treat addiction. Right, and if you think about what, what, what the yeah. goal of being a young person is to b become a free-thinking person and, right. and f move into a adulthood with an idea of who you are, the idea of treatment of like sit down, shut up, and listen to what I'm saying so you can do it right doesn't do anything for them. They have to learn how to do That's that right. themselves. And for treatment history, it's a lot harder on the staff to do that. And it, it's much easier to say sit down and shut up and listen to what I have to say but that's not that's not the way you get through. They have to discover things about themselves and they have a lot to teach us too. And I think when you come at them from that angle that they have of love. empowerment. It's love. Yeah. What if, what, let's just say hypothetically though, you have a kid and you find that it, you know your son's got some marijuana on him. Mm -hmm. And there's other than finding marijuana, you haven't really seen other symptoms. Do you get parents that like freak out and come right to inpatient treatment and think the kid needs to be in rehab or We do. You no, do not often, and, but we do. do. You, do you screen them out, or do you refer them to IOPs, or do you take them in? Like, what, what's your thought? All on of that? the above. It depends right. on the situation because sometimes you'll have a situation where you have, you know, an overprotective parent that's, you know, more worried than they need to be. Sometimes you're walking right into the dynamic that you want to work on because right. it's not. It's not about the weed. It's not about the marijuana. It's about uh, this dynamic that we have to get to because if you squeeze this kid too much too long you're going to inhibit their ability to deal with things and then that leads to things that are worse later on and if you can nip it in the bud that's great and sometimes you can so do it through so outpatient what, sometimes. so what's your advice you know uh, parents listening out there and maybe they've caught their kids a couple times drinking and using drugs what what's a normal reaction do you think or what should be the normal reaction I, I think the biggest part what what you do in treatment once it's gone haywire is about learning how to create an open communication with your kid and that's not going to be completely possible because you're the parent and you're supposed to be a nerd at some point and right. their friends are more important to them but to keep it to keep the door open as wide as you can and with the invitation that you can always walk through and discuss these things with me in a, in a con in a consultive kind of way and that doesn't mean that you know parents don't have veto power and at some point you have to stop things and say no to things but the long-term success, especially later in adolescence, the 16, 17-year-olds who are about to get out there on their own, it's about, we, you know, I know a few things and you know a few things and we should be talking about this together and learning from each other so we can create something healthier. And, and that's how, awkward too, because part of yeah. being an adolescent is separating from your parents is having your own identity. And, and you know, uh, we know that women have much more problems with separation uh, over the long term and more problems with personality disorders because uh, it's hard to separate from your mom if you're female. Um, if you're male, you have sort of a natural reaction to want to separate from your mother and then find another female to sort of attach yourself to. Right. Um, I, generally, not always, but <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, I, I just want to jump back to the yeah. issue, just just for those who are listening, you know, who some who may have problems with addiction and those who are just maybe normies like myself who had to come, uh, you know, been around people with addiction and whatnot. And, you know, for me, the natural progression of, of somebody getting to know more about it at first, I was somebody who was just like, oh, come on, you know, kick it into gear. They deserve. I'd see something, somebody acting out, i go, they deserve jail. They deserve that. That's what they deserve. Right. And it was from a position of just uh, of no compassion, no sensitivity, and really no understanding, which probably goes hand in hand. And after a while of many, many years of being around people, uh, you know, it's sort of like, it seems like America with the gay issue, where it's sort of like somebody started out with a gay uncle. And then they're like, well, I mean, <laughs> it shouldn't be allowed, but... Except for my uncle, Al, <laughs> so, yeah. you know. And, and after a while, it's sort of like you see these people to be really wonderful people, and they're not bad people. They're, it's it's really seeing that they have a defect uh, is the same way that you're not saying the gay people have the defect. You're uh, saying no, the drug no, addicts. Listen, we're back uh, we to the drug addicts. Yeah. <laughs> they're born that way. Well, you know, but, and and you're right because people don't use substances. The kids that I treat don't use substances to be jerks. They're right. doing it to. You know, it's a bad coping mechanism. Sometimes at the beginning, it's like, uh, oh, it's fun. It's, it's experimentation. I'm, I'm with friends. But then it turns into, if it turns into regular use, it's about I'm trying to cope with this disturbance, this pain, uh, something. And then it gets a hold of them. So it's, it's never about uh, uh, just, tr you know, some, some defect in moral character. Yeah, I mean, also, you got to remember, people are sort of naturally set up to deny what, what's wrong in their lives. And sometimes it takes a long time for people to notice like, oh, you know, when my uncle killed himself, that really actually affected me. 
and they cover that up with drugs or that, you know, that mom leaving really was a big deal, you know, and they tried to act for years that it wasn't. And then all of a sudden, you know, using drugs enabled them to just not deal with it. And then all of a sudden they're a drug addict. They don't know how that happened. And it's literally like that for yeah. someone that becomes a drug addict. And I don't think yeah. regular people that don't have a drug problem understand that drug addicts and I don't think, that's think they the majority. would ever want to be a drug addict. Like nobody, and nobody goes out. Like, well, there's a few people probably went out. I want to be like, you know, I want to be a rock and roll drug addict. But right. most people don't really want to be a drug addict. I mean, they want to use and be able to keep using and not be an addict. Here's my question. If a person says in, <laughs> in the course of 45 minutes that they're a normie five times, yeah, right. you think yeah. they might have a problem? <laughs> so uh, I'm, drug here, test right here. I'm, I'm here to add that five perspective to say that, no, I didn't bottom out, but I can still care about yeah. those people and add compassion to it. And yeah, that really is, point. by the way. It's a great point. No, it's, really, it's a great point that, that, that I feel the reason why I'm active and involved in this area it's is amazing to say, what you're doing is to say you know what i i didn't i'm not trying to like justify my actions with my behavior i i am a for six time a norm i didn't go <laughs> that's down. it we got them now all right oh, here they are they're coming to me not the white jacket so I, I, you know and i think that so many people i had that and once i got over that uh that sort of no they deserve that they did have you know and really became more sensitive that's what i'm trying to do is sort of allow other people to understand that it's like yelling at somebody who's 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 blind who who in the yelling at the top you know see or deaf <laughs> or whatever they regard yelling at somebody for some sort of defect that, that and, and you're yelling at them for something they can't control and then people will, of course, fight back and make. But the, I, I think the, the and obviously you guys are so much more educated and know this. But something that I learned about was uh, hearing about craving and not understanding what that just how real that was. Because I'm like, well, I, I'd like to I'd like to go out and get a nice piece of cake right now. But you know what? I, I, is there a difference? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's compulsive disorders beyond just addiction. And there's different types of compulsive disorders that lead to addiction. So, you know, all these things are so complex. And I think that's what's important for people out there to hear is that there's all these different interventions, not just for substance abuse, but for all the underlying things that can create substance abuse. By the way, if you so. just tuned in, you are listening to Clean Radio. We have a great show tonight. We're in the studio with uh, Jeff Nalen, owner and operator, yes. founder of uh, Paradigm uh, Malibu, which is an amazing treatment center in Malibu that helps treats adolescents. And we have Bluegrass Sensation, Jaron <laughs> Lowenstein, um, <laughs> formerly of the Bluegrass Sensation, Evan and Jaron, and, uh, which is also amazing, by the way. He hit an awesome country hit in 2010. It's called Jaron and the Long Road Home. And, uh, We're close. Jaron and the Long Road Home. Love. It and uh, it's really, it's an amazing song. And it actually, I just want to bring up it had two videos. A yeah, song called Pray For You. Yeah. yeah, I'll Pray For You. And it's a great song. Uh, I've watched it many times. And it has one with Jamie Priestley in the video. And one Can you get anybody's... How is this guy in the air? You can't get it. It's Jamie Presley. Jamie Presley. <laughs> <laughs> how, are you, how are you the host? That's like, actually... This, just this, so you this, know... Because this, this is for Alan to yeah. show what alcohol does. Phonetics? Yeah, right. the brain. <laughs> 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 Andrew and I one day will tell you a great story about mispronouncing a guest's name and the uh, hell we had to pay for it after. Uh, yeah. uh, but let's get back. I mean, I love what you guys are doing. You guys set up this facility in Malibu to treat adolescents. And I don't think enough people are dealing with this issue like you guys are dealing with it. You guys are dealing with it head on. And you guys are dealing with it in the sense of don't kick the kids out. You know, yeah. let's let how are we going to deal? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. You know, Andrew said it earlier, it's like the youth that we see are incredibly sensitive people. And when they get through treatment and it starts to work for them, that sensitivity really plays into a lot of good things for them. But before they get a grip on it, it can it can trip them up. And that's that's the biggest thing that they have to start learning how to deal with without I th substances. also think that's the hope that if you look at people that have recovered from addiction, especially younger people, they tend to be sensitive, caring, really uh, creative people that go out and do amazing things in their lives. There's no doubt. So, you know, if you're a parent and you're out there and you're thinking, oh, you know, my son's a complete screw up or my daughter's in real trouble, you know, uh, that's not the truth. The reality is, is that you actually have someone that has huge potential. Uh, and they just need to, you know, a little little help. Yeah, it's le it's just learning how to get a rein on how they feel and start to control it instead of letting it control them. And I say it all the time. It's like it, once you do that, 
you, you know, you can take over the world in a good way, whatever way you want. And and these guys are starting way before any of us started. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm so hopeful for all of them. And I think sometimes that's the hardest part. And I often talk about it because I hate it. I got sober what's now considered old. Uh-huh. I got sober when I was 22. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it drove me nuts because people would say to me, you're so lucky you got this while you're young. Mm-hmm. And I would look at them and say, shut up. <laughs> you're so lucky you got this while you're old. Because right. I was so jealous that they had the extra 20 years of drinking and they were so jealous that I didn't have to go with through. and then I just realized no matter what age you get there you're miserable you know you could be 15 30 60 you're miserable because you should be miserable you just lost your best friend yeah and I say you know even good changes in our lives and this is the example I use for kids it's like when you get into the college of your choice this great thing that's happening to you and then you move across the country and you move into the dorms it's like all of a sudden the nervousness comes up. It's like, I make the right decision. This is not what I thought was going to be. My roommate's a tool. And mm-hmm. all of this stuff starts to happen. So that's with a good change. So when you're talking about making a difficult change and facing some of the emotional things in your life, it's really, really difficult. But the long-term bonus to doing it intensely at the beginning is all of a sudden you get comfortable in your own skin and you have this long period of time of being okay and being authentic and the people around you know who you are. And you're miserable because you have a Jewish brain. That's <laughs> just how it is. Check you're giving away all your stuff Check today. No, I mean, come on. I, I told you what that Woody Allen line and his, that documentary just came out. Yeah. That he was, you could say it on the radio. Yeah, he got, uh, he said he wanted to be a director, was a director. He wanted to be a writer, was a writer. He wanted to be a comedian, comedian. He wanted to be a jazz performer, clarinet at the highest levels. And he's like, I feel like every dream I ever wanted came true, and yet somehow I feel like I got screwed. <laughs> because that is the Jewish condition. Yes. <laughs> it really is. And that actually sums up sort of sometimes the addict condition, too, is that no matter what I have, no matter all of these things, I... But, you know, I, but I also was, people don't understand, I think, that it's not about what you achieve, it's the process of achieving it, like work. Work is not necessarily the end result of what you've created. It's You have to really enjoy the working, otherwise you're not enjoying life. It's being present in the moment and having real rewards and attachment to what you do every day. Yeah. If, you're, if you're just waiting for some result and think that all of a sudden you're going to get all the rewards at the end of the result, then you're never going to be happy. You're going to be miserable 90% of your life or more. Um, and then you get this big letdown that make you feel depressed. You're like, oh, well, I guess that wasn't as cool as I thought it was going to be. Right, right. right. I got a lot of thinking to do tonight. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't say normie for the second I got um, to change some stuff around. <laughs> I want to do, I, I do want to wish, uh, she just uh, posted this on Facebook. I want to uh, wish Kim C. She, on the 8th of July, she'll have 11 months clean and sober, and she's loving it. So right. I just want to say right. congratulations. Right. That's awesome. And there's so many people out there that are fighting that good fight, you know, of staying sober. Is it hard when kids get out of rehab? Do you, I mean, going to the 12-step meetings, or because they're so young now, the meetings, some of them, that they, they're able to integrate a lot easier? You know, I think they are. It's, you know, some of it depends on... Uh, what's going on with them but when they when they get out uh you know that's when the rubber meets the road for everybody that's in treatment right and so you you get to start to implement some of the things you learned and that's why if you're doing real life kind of work about how am i going to integrate this into my life it gets easier and certainly you know 12-step support that's out there is huge and there's a lot of young people's meetings and it's great because it always winds up throwing a wrench in their belief system that if you're if you're sober it's going to be lame yeah. and then they meet a lot of young people who are sober too so if you're doing if you're doing all of that work and if you have the context to put it in of like I know that I do these things with the events that happen in my life and I've got to watch that because it can lead me down a road uh, and then get the support around that I think I think they have a really good shot of, of and, and uh, I know that you stay in touch with a lot of those kids I mean we talk about them, kids from years ago and yep. I'm sure that's got to help uh, some level just to have access yeah. to you. Well, I, I mean, I think it, I think it's helpful. I mean, we say that you know anybody who's been through our treatment program can have aftercare as long as they want. And what we what winds up happening is like you will be at dinner and somebody from two thousand nine will walk in the door and uh, and and want to come in and either they're doing great or they're feeling you know sketchy and they and they just want to be around it for another minute. And so. Uh, it, which is great for us because it's, you know they're, they're there and you're staying in touch with them and they're showing the new people what it can look like down the road. So they serve as role models. And I think being of service is such an important piece of it. So. By the way, if you just tuned in, you are listening to Clean Radio. That's uh, Jeff Nalen, um, founder of, co-founder of Paradigm Malibu, an amazing treatment center for 
adolescence. Also to his left is uh, I'm out of uh, music, music <laughs> genres. Uh, blues. Jaren spoken Lowenstein. word, blues specialist. Yeah, spoken okay. word. <laughs> and, and Andrew Spanswick, co-owner, co-operator of uh, Clean Treatment Center. And one of the cool things, I love this sort of mingling going on, this is great interaction because you have a lot of the same belief systems that we also have at Clean, which is, you know, throw his, you want to say? Um, you know, just trying to treat people and not always the same. Everybody's different. Everybody's yeah. unique. And I think you know, for a long time, with alcoholism, because we had to, mm -hmm. you know, we had to say this is the cure. This is the one. Well, I think thing. also the treatment industry has had to grow up. Yeah. I mean, you know, I started in psychiatric only. I only had acute care psychiatric hospitals. And right. I had nine throughout the United States, and ironically, they were called paradigm health systems. Yeah, so funny. So, <laughs> but uh, great mind. bringing it back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bringing bring it, back. it back. Right. So anyway, but uh, so when I was running my paradigm, my first that was my first company, and. Uh, I was 100% just about psych. Psych. It was all psych. Right. I mean, everything was, you know, right. it was locked down, acute care psych. They came in, they smoked crack. They had one group a week about that. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that they had, you know, paranoid schizophrenia, and that's what I was going to deal with. Right. So, um, you know, the crack was an afterthought. Uh, you know, and I would look at people in the treatment industry at that time, and that was, you know, I guess 20 years ago when I started, and it was so primitive. I mean, it really was. Yeah. It just, there was no real thought about, you know, people are still arguing intensely about whether it was a disease or not. I yeah. mean, the anti-disease model group have, was overwhelmingly the majority. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, we've seen now that people are accepting more and more that addiction actually is a disease. Right. Um, and so we've seen also within the psychiatric community, acute care psychiatric community, the, uh, more of an acceptance that, you know, there's something about substance abuse that uh, we really do need to address on a clinical level. Yeah. Um, and since in the last 20 years, we've seen huge development away from just simple, basic models of dealing with behavior and, and education into really complex, uh, interactive ways to detox people properly, to actually teach them cognitively. Um, through cognitive behavioral therapy or, or dialectical behavioral therapy or even psychoanalysis about what's going on, not just with them currently, but also, you know, what's going on in their past. And then we have ongoing treatment and aftercare. And it's become this whole this whole environment, this longitudinal form of care that didn't exist. Yeah, it's true. And and I, that's why, I, you know, I wanted to come on. I think you guys do great work. And uh you know, I've said it a million times too that adolescent treatment is in sort of an adolescence, that it's been going from what you're talking about into from strictly behavioral, we got to stop this. Right. Or that Behavior behavioral. mod was like yeah. all they did. Yeah. I mean, that was it. And now it's like, no, it, the truth is, is that these underlying issues, these psychiatric issues, depression and, and trauma, a lot of trauma, especially. Do you have, uh, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit because I always say growing up, when I got sober, I, I, I really had a lot of post-traumatic stress. Absolutely. Growing up in the certain community I grew up in, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of stuff that not I Not knowing had, what a female was. Not knowing was what 19. a female was. <laughs> I was 16. Just, 16, 16, 16 yes. sorry. I graduated high school early. And, <laughs> Dude, and, I'm going to let you finish, but Andrew had the best line. <laughs> yes. Um, Kanye joke. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if Jeff, Jeff, you're always welcome back to Clean Radio, by the way. Um, uh, but I just wanted to share this quickly because um, we we are running out of time. And I love what you said about the people out there. If you just tune in and listen to Clean Radio, but the thing you're talking about is that dialogue, having that continuing dialogue. Because Andrew and I have a good friend of ours a couple of years ago had a big issue with their daughter. I'm not going to say the name. And yeah. he didn't know what to do. Yeah. Spoke to Andrew and I, and he opened up a dialogue. And the, and, and the person's uh, child is 16 now, doing amazing. That's great. And, and he set up a dialogue with that, you know, with that, with his, with his child. And it, it helped tremendously. She, they weren't a drug addict, but they were going through issues. Yeah. And because of the issues, he was able to talk. Yeah. The most dangerous thing is to be stuck in, in your own head and giving your own consultation to yourself. You can just start spinning. It creates anxiety. And, you know, sometimes the benefit of what we do is, and I say this to parents all the time, is that I'm going to say the same things that you're saying, but I'm not going to look or sound like you. They can hear me better right. than they can hear you. And then we work to get you to be the person that they consult with. And if you can start that, you can start that at two years old with your kid, at five years old. It's like having that connection where there's open communication and I can express what's happening for me, good, bad, and ugly, 
that's a real beginning of the recipe. Of, a lot of that's of, about safety and trust. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's all about you know, safety right. and trust. And, yeah. And when you're younger and you're, and if your parents are punitive at first, an attempt actually just to be helpful. Right. Um, I got to hide a little bit and then right. it grows. And then it gets bigger and bigger yeah. and bigger. And then you, all of a sudden you have this problem where there's a, a really antagonistic dynamic between the parent and the child. And so there is no openness, there is no trust. Right, and I mean, and part of, you know, what we do, like we have a whole expressive arts program, you know, music, writing. Uh, I'd love to hear more about that. Drama. <laughs> yeah. and Normie the Lowenstein, Lowenstein. 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 Yeah. he's involved. But you know, using those experiential therapies to have stuff start to leak out for them yeah. when they're really defended verbally is so helpful with oh. young people. And then it then it just feeds all it's the almost talk like, you know, therapy. It's almost like, you know, years ago, I mean, they haven't had shop in school for years. They haven't had, yeah. and you have, a, you have a high school program, right? Or, yeah. You have yes. a high school program. They don't there. have shop and, in school anymore. No, I they, just no, found that out there's too. There's none of this. Yeah. Really? And so, so it's <laughs> no either, metal, no wood. You're so people still have all their fingers right, now. Yeah, right. People are graduating <laughs> yeah. with all their fingers. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I always say X Men. My favorite thing about X Men. I I love the movie, but I always thought I always like thought it was like you know that's what I say about alcoholics. You know they have these amazing skills right. that just need to be honed. That's right. You know, and I I love that about X Men. You had these mutants and you know calling alcoholics mutants. I am one, but I just needed my skills. It's a wonderful honed. mutant. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It, and 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 I love what you're doing. You're 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 honing their skills. You're you know you're training them, showing them who they can be. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, I want to thank for having Jaren, me. the Normie Lowenstein, yeah. for uh, introducing <laughs> do us. I get a, do I get a, f a final thought here? Or we do yes, you do. Off? Final thought. I, no, I just wanted to say that with more and more people living longer and more and more people on the planet, this problem is not going away. It's no. going to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Absolutely. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, life's too short. It's actually, I think, that life's too long and we haven't figured out a way to deal with it. And that's why... More and more. I mean, the you know, you, life expectancy you know, what's interesting doubled about that is we're years. finding out that geriatric substance abuse is becoming yep. a real problem. Yep. Um, and it used to be that people would just die off. That, you know, grandma would hit 65 and that's it. You know, you don't have to worry about it. Now grandma's 65. She's going to live to 85. Uh -huh. And they're they're right. 20, years, drugs, the 20 drugs, years of drinking, STDs, all these amazing yeah. things they're getting at the that's age right. of 65. Well, well, how, what are you going to do to pass time? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you're going to. I love it. Sound like, what do you do to like I have a successful life? There. What do you do to pass time? I want to thank all our Facebook <laughs> listeners. I want to thank Jaron Lowenstein. Played every Xbook thank, game. I want to thank uh, Jeff uh, Nalen. Nalen from Nalen from founder and clinical director Paradigm. I want to thank Rand, our director, Steve behind the boards, Mark, Patrick. My girlfriend Melissa, who's taking amazing pictures back there. I had to put that out there that he's still got a girlfriend. And yeah, thank you, you guys. Do. Um, I just want to thank my fan. Thank you. Yes, and okay. you want to thank God, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> the discussion <laughs> continues at cleanradio.com. Hey. Misfortune Radio is next. Talk to you all next week. Are you or someone you care about addicted to drugs or alcohol? Addiction ruins lives and destroys families. Bring an end to the pain and suffering by calling Clean Treatment Centers. Clean has helped people from around the world break free by not only treating the addiction, but the underlying causes and providing vital aftercare so people can get clean and stay clean with no gimmicks and no false promises. If you need immediate assistance or just have questions, call Clean Treatment Centers for guidance. A much better life awaits.